Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Beyond Seven Figures podcast. I find out that our particular guest has been called the Warren Buffett of lifestyle investing by entrepreneur. He's a number one best-selling author of The Lifestyle Investor, The Ten Commandments of Cashflow Investing for Passive Income and Financial Freedom. He's also the founder of Lifestyle Investor, specializes in low-risk cash flow investing, simplifying financial strategies, structuring deals, and so forth. He's an entrepreneur himself, owns a bunch of franchises, businesses, so forth. But rather than me tell you all about how cool this guy is, I want you to hear it for yourself. Justin Donald, welcome to the show, my friend. Hey, thanks, Charlie. Great to be here. Appreciate you uh, having me on. You know, our market, they're predominantly seven, eight-figure founders, CEOs, and so forth. And they've done well. But when I learned a bit more about your origin story and how you were able to multiply your net worth to over eight figures and escape sort of the, the hamster wheel, I have a sneaking suspicion. So if you wouldn't mind, I'd love to dive a little bit more into that story. Let's do it. Take us from the start. Take us from the very beginning. I mean, early on in my marriage, my wife and I really were on opposite schedules. I had time off when she was working. She was a teacher. And so she didn't have a lot of flexibility in her schedule. But the times that she was off were really busy for me, for my business then. And it felt like we just weren't quite... I remember thinking early on, at some point, I wanted to be financially free, and that would be really cool. But I realized quickly, I actually need to start by helping my wife buy her time back and create financial freedom there, because once we could be on the same page, that would just be a step in the right direction, a major lifestyle move for us. I had a friend that was interested in, he basically had these single family homes and there were a lot more work than he thought. He wasn't making as much as he thought. He was trying to do all the work and he realized that maybe that wasn't the right path for him. He didn't have scale quite yet. Maybe he should sell them and buy a mobile home park. And so he asked me if I would have any interest. And I said, no, that I have no interest. Doesn't sound appealing at all. He ends up going to that seminar, buying a mobile home park. He sold all his other homes. And next thing I know, he's doing very well financially. So I did what I know best, which is to copy people that have a great track record, that have proven strategies. So I don't have to reinvent the wheel on my own. Bought a mobile home park and that single transaction replaced my wife's income. She was able to retire. We shortly thereafter had our daughter. And she was able to be a stay at home. We were all on the same schedule for traveling purposes, got to travel all over. It was just amazing to buy her time back. But, it, but that was step one. So I bought another mobile home park and the proceeds of that covered the rest of what we needed for survival income. Two parks, mm -hmm. two transactions. Now all of a sudden I don't have to work. Now, keep in mind, Charlie, this is not lifestyle income yet. This isn't counting having fancy dinners and going on vacation. This is just getting us by mortgage, car payments, utilities, groceries, but lifting that bag of weight, like a backpack full of bricks off of my back, breathing fully, recognizing I don't have to work now, I get to work and I get to work on my timeline because now I don't need the money. I can be smarter about how I do it. Now I can create more boundaries about what I will do, won't do, when I will work, when I won't, who I'm going to outsource things to, what activities I just don't even want to touch versus what ones I, I enjoy or I really need to have a pulse of. And it just gave me this freedom in creativity, creating the role that I wanted in the business. It bought me some time back. It bought me better decision making. It bought me making decisions not from a scarce standpoint or not from a, a purely financial standpoint. Because sometimes as entrepreneurs, we make decisions and at the top of the decision tree is, can I afford it? But that may not be the right decision. You can actually make decisions like what's best for the company, what's best for our clients and customers. And so I think you make better decisions because it's not based purely on financials or the top of the fulcrum is not financials. And um, from there, we bought another park that replaced our lifestyle income. We actually sold that one, flipped it into two other parks because we just got a crazy offer and that replaced our earned income. And so, you know, we were really in a, a fun season where 
We didn't have to work. We got to work. We got to do it on our timeline. Uh, and we decided to take a year off and travel the world and figure out what was next. So what are the different classifications, income in your world? So how do you define the different buckets of income? Earned income being one. Yeah, earned income is your highest income. It's your salary income. It has the most taxes or, or fees coming off it, if you will. There's the most impact on those dollars. You got ordinary income after that. You've got passive income. You've got gift income. I mean, those are your major buckets that exist. The goal is how do you move from earned income, which is your highest tax dollars, to passive income, which is your lowest tax dollars? And it, is it possible for you to move completely to a passive investor? Because if you can do that, you can literally pay the least amount of taxes. I mean, so little in taxes people would think that it's not possible. And in many cases, it's paying nothing in taxes because you're doing exactly what the government wants. You're partnering with the government. You're using the IRS code as a playbook to say, hey, if the government's incentivizing these behaviors, maybe I should do them because I get a tax benefit and it helps stimulate the economy, which is what they want. It's funny, I had dinner with a gentleman a while ago, one of the most successful people south of Boston. This is when I was living up in New England. And he said to me, do you know that every month I get subsidized by the state of Massachusetts for my health insurance? And he says, I get subsidized. My health insurance costs me $35 a month. How much does it cost you? And I'm like, oh my God, like thousands, according to the government. I'm, I'm not broke. I'm in the poverty level. I get all this stuff and I don't pay taxes. I'm like, what are you doing and how is that legal? And then he went into all of these different ways that the government can partner. And it just blew my mind. Not saying you want to tap into all these free programs and whatnot. You do what you may, but I did. you do find that there's this point as people earn money, they go to earn money because they look at how do I put more money in my bank? And then they realize, wait a minute. I end up giving away almost half of it. So now you started with mobile parks. Now for a lot of our listeners, probably not going to be buying mobile home parks. So what advice do you give now to the CEO, to the founder that is running a seven figure business right now that might not have a lot of that free capital to just go ahead and throw down on a piece of real estate? Well, I think there's a number of things. Number one, I would say, do you enjoy what you're doing? Do you enjoy the hours you're working? Do you enjoy the role that you have? And if so, that's good. I'd say most people don't have that. So that's really good. On the flip side of the equation, for a lot of entrepreneurs, they're just working so hard. They don't have the time to think. They don't have the time to do other deals. Some may not have the capital for it. Most just don't have the time for it. And sometimes it's both, right? But just because you don't have the money doesn't mean that a deal can't get done. I lived in Chicago at that time, and I really wanted to get into buying these three flats and four flats, but they were so expensive where I lived. But what I realized now and over time is that if, if you have a really good asset, it's really easy to raise money for that asset. I think it's good to have some money to contribute. But at the end of the day, if you have a good deal, you can easily find the money for that good deal if it truly is good and then i would also say for some people there's the opportunity you can be a capital partner you can be like a deal sourcing partner there's a lot of value that you can bring you don't have to be the whole equation you can just be part of the equation and you can partner up with other people that have different skill sets or different resources that kind of complete that equation to be a winning one are you suggesting that many of the founders and CEOs should look for investment opportunities that extend beyond their current business? It depends. A lot of the time people want to stay in their area of expertise. And so if you know something, this niche really well, maybe it makes sense to, to buy assets in that place that you know it. But with businesses, as all entrepreneurs know, the, the likelihood of it succeeding is really low. 
So if you've already run your business for a few years, maybe even five years, that you're in such a small percentage of people. The beauty of a business is it. There's no ceiling. There are astronomical returns if it's the right business, if it's run properly, if it's in a market, has a large market cap, so many good things there. But a business can go to zero at any time. And when all of your net worth is tied into one single business, that's a lot of risk. If you look at the wealthiest people in the world, people that have their own family office that run their investments in their life, very very rarely do you see anything beyond nice allocation where approximately 20 to 30 percent in private equity, including their business. You've got another 20, 25 percent in real estate. You've got another 15 to 25 percent in public equities, the stock market. And then you've got another, let's call it 20 to 25 percent in everything else private credit, sure. fixed income, cash equivalent, commodities, precious metals, dough, infrastructure, art, wine, bourbon, whatever, uncorrelated yeah. assets, right? And if you look at it from that standpoint, it makes sense to say, am I, where am I at here? There's a, a huge risk reward profile, but there's also the risk is palpable, right? The likelihood of it going to zero is not as strong as a business, but your return is going to be capped. You're, maybe you're getting 10 to 15% in appreciation a year. So I think it's really just pros and cons to each strategy, each deal. So if you're not an expert, it'd be, it's important if you're going to get into a space to become very well educated, but you can also just outsource it to a team that is doing a syndication or doing a fund that is very educated and they've been doing it for 15, 20 years. So you don't need to learn it. You can just earn the return on it. One of the decisions that we made early on is we wanted to figure out how do we keep more of the money that we've earned? But in a sense, not only do we keep it, but how do we keep it while building a legacy? And real estate is one of those things that it could just be something that you spend a little time looking for deals in the evening, or maybe you spend a little time on the weekends. Maybe you just plant the seeds with your accountants, your attorneys, let them know the type of properties that you're looking for and just keep the conversation alive. And we've ended up picking up some commercial properties, a couple retail locations, mill building, so forth. The buildings that we bought, we knew that they weren't going to make money the first year because there needed to be some changes. There were going to be some tenant turnover. We knew that they weren't going to make money. However, because of the bonus depreciation, that the past administration passed, the amount of money that we earned as a result of the bonus depreciation offset such a huge amount of our taxes that if you just look at it at a base level on a spreadsheet, we ended up making an enormous amount of money by not having to pay that money in taxes. And it goes on and on. Just one lease alone that was signed, one ink one piece of paper automatically increased the value of one of the buildings by $500,000. It's beautiful. Signature. Beautiful. Occupied versus unoccupied, big difference, big difference in valuation. We don't ever want to let the tax tail wag the dog and get into a bad deal just for the tax deductions. But if you can find a great deal that you would have bought anyway, and then, oh yeah, you also have these great tax benefits. When I think about people and I think about money, I look oftentimes in quadrants or in group kind of group people or group areas where people may be. And the reality is most people are not good at making money. So if you're actually good at making money, that's like the first quadrant where you're, you, you're good at making money. Very few people are there, but those that are there, they know how to do it. And then from there, you move over to managing money. Most people are horrible at managing money. So a lot of them will outsource it. By the way, a lot of people outsource it to people that are not very good at managing money. They just don't know it. They don't know it yet. They don't know it until. But you have far less people that are good at managing money than are at making money. Then you move to the next quadrant, that third quadrant, which is multiplying money. You have the smallest percentage of people that are actually good at multiplying money. And that's the one where you know, I just wanted to focus my time and energy in that space, talking to people that do that, because that's where you can get those outliers. That's where you can really get your capital working for you and get your mind working for you and earning multiples well beyond what most people would. And even just having the relationships to get the private deals to have access to returns like that. And then that fourth quadrant is making money matter. And I think for those of us that uh, have been entrusted with uh, great wealth, we owe it to the world, to, to people, to make the world a better place and invest in, in the things that 
you know, that, that really break your heart and give to the things that really can truly help people and make the world a better place. That's actually super important. That last part in particular reminds me of something that I learned from a guy named Dr. John Martini, where he talked about if you want your wealth will be in direct proportion to the impact that you want to make in this world, which is if you just want to make enough money to make yourself rich, you'll only make a fraction. If you do it for your family, you make a little more, you do it for your community, a little more than that. And then your state, your country, the world. But if you look at the wealthiest people in the world right now, where are they going? Space. Yeah. They've already made, you got Elon Musk that is trying to colonize Mars. You've got Jeff Bezos and Richard Branson and whatnot looking into space because the impact that they're trying to make is so huge that it's going beyond the world. You know what you're saying, that other impact, I have this sneaking suspicion that what you're doing on the fourth area that you talked about, trying to change the world, is actually helping to put more money in the third bucket as well. That's right, 100%. I feel that's where my gifting is, so I wanna be able to teach people how to do it. I enjoy that, and I think that it's a great way to help people provide an incredible life for their family, but to have the means to be incredibly generous as well. You talked about multiplying money. How do you multiply money? What is your framework? I think there are a lot of different ways. If you look at buying real estate, for example, since we talked about that, you can buy with a small down payment compared to the total value of a property. So you can borrow some money from a bank. You can do seller finance with an owner. You can increase the value, the rentals, the whatever. You can increase that revenue, increase that profitability. And not only do assets appreciate as monetary supply expands. So we print more money, the value of assets increases in tandem with that. So you have this built-in appreciation that's going to happen anyway, just because of the debasing of our currency. But you add value to the property. You increase rents, you fill vacancies, you cut expenses. You do all these things where you can make the property more valuable at the same time. You're making it more profitable. Therefore, the multiple on it grows the value of it. And, and maybe, depending on how you do it, maybe you even increase that multiple. Right. So many ways to do it on that side. I just listed a bunch of them right there on the, the private equity side. Having a business is going to look a little different. And it's still the same point of grow revenue, cut expenses, try to increase profitability. But there are other ways you can do it. You can buy other companies to, to scale based on acquisition. You can take a company that doesn't have much of a technology footprint or SEO footprint, and you can enhance that. We bought a dog training company one time that didn't have a ton of SEO, and we were able to really do a great job there and build some systems on the tech stack there that they didn't have. And that company took, they put $100,000 down, and I brought in a friend, an operating partner to run it, and actually gave him the majority of the equity just because I wanted to help him get out of the rat race and I wanted him to be totally pot committed to this thing. But in a year and a day, we sold it. So a year and a day for long-term capital gains, but we made almost a 12 X on our money. It was like 11.9 X on our money or 11.8 X on our money in a year and a yeah. day, right? What did we do? We bought a, a company that, that didn't, that wasn't fully booked. They had plenty of openings. We expanded the window for appointments, uh, just a ton of things. And by the way, Chief just won the Super Bowl. Patrick Mahomes, everyone is probably thinking the world of him. He trained his dog in our studio in Kansas City. Yeah. And he's the nicest guy in the world, just an incredible human being. What A lot of these businesses that you can buy, mom and pop businesses, they, they don't even know they can sell it. So they might just be thinking, yeah. hey, I'm going to wrap, Just I'm just going to hang up the cleats and be done and just turn it off. Just close, t turn the close sign on and be done you can actually talk some of those people into selling it. They don't know that there's value. They think the value is them yeah. running it as the operator. The customers have value. You can build some better systems, build a footprint. A lot of these people don't have websites. They don't, they're not even on Google Maps. There's just so much low hanging fruit to be able to grow the business, grow the presence, do all these things that multiply value. We could do several episodes just on this specific topic in one specific business, right? But that's just a handful of examples on how to multiply wealth.
get your money working for you, get it working for you as fast as you can, get a return on your money as quickly as you can, try to set up terms that allow you to pull money back quickly, even though the deal's still going on and reinvest those dollars somewhere else and do that many times over. A lot of what Justin's talking about right now, if we were a little birdie sitting on his shoulder and looking at how he spends his time, it sounds to me like the time he's spending is based on making decisions that are worth millions of dollars versus many times we get so stuck on being reactive and so stuck on being busy that we'll find ourselves doing things that we could have delegated to an assistant where we spend all this time doing things at $20 an hour just to get things done. Whereas Justin is using that same time to try to find a deal that could put several million dollars in his pocket. So the first step to creating this type of wealth begins with what is your return on time? How can you maximize the use of that time? And are you making the best decisions? I remember having a conversation with Ari Mizell, who was at one time Tony Robbins' personal productivity coach. And when I was talking with Ari, I was like, hey, Ari, walk me through something. I'm trying to make a decision in my mind and I'm, I can't figure out what the best decision is. And I walked him through two different scenarios and he's, Charlie, do you hear yourself? And I'm like, I'm lost. What do you mean? And he goes, one decision is worth thousands of dollars. The next decision is potentially worth millions of dollars. You're struggling off of do I do make the thousands of dollar decision or the millions of dollar decision? Focus on the return on time. And I'm like, oh, how did I not even, like how did I not connect those dots? But it is true. Higher we the return on time, then the higher we end up seeing that roll back into our bank accounts. And it's hard sometimes. That? I was just gonna say, it's hard sometimes to even get in a space where we can proactively think about our business until we, carve out that think time where we just have a time and space because otherwise we just live a reactionary life it's like on autopilot this problem we put up this fire and do this thing and back to back and this person needs to talk to you. how do you proactively plan anything if you're always on default on on autopilot right we've got to carve out that time and space to think to be able to make these decisions that are million dollar decisions now let's take a just a sidestep for a minute if we might so you're a best-selling author you've got a ton of followers across social media. I'm trying to remember offhand, how many followers would you guess if you were to estimate across social media? I don't even know, probably maybe 100,000. So you've created an extraordinary personal brand for yourself. What tips do you have for those listening on how do you create a personal brand? I think for me, I just got clarity on what I wanted to do with the next chapter of my life. I never thought I would be in the spotlight. That was never my MO. As some of these articles started coming out, people started hearing me on podcasts. It's fun just being in the shadows, but at the same time, you don't have the same influence and impact. And so that to me was important. So during our year off, I mean, we traveled the globe and I just got really clear on what I enjoyed. I woke up and read every day. I love reading. The more I read, the more I want to teach people. I coached a bunch of my friends to financial freedom. So I enjoy that. I still like doing deals. They're fun. So it's like, how do I build something that incorporates all those into it? And not in a million years would I have thought that people would find uh, as much uh, enjoyment or satisfaction in the things that I enjoy as they do. I just, I never guessed it. I, when I launched my book, I did, I had an email list of zero. I remember like thinking of a bunch of friends. I'm like, man, I'm just going to email some of these friends and see if they'll buy my book. That'd be really cool if they did. And if I sell, I don't know, under 200 copies, I'm going to feel pretty good about that. My buddy was like, well, if you ever get to 10,000 books over the life of the book, that's a really successful book because most people don't do that. So my expectations were low. I didn't have a following. And next thing I know, stuff, the book went viral on social media. We sold 10,000 plus copies in the first few days and I don't become a number one Wall Street Journal bestseller. But I actually believe that the success of the book, there's a lot of right time, right place. There's also early on, I said, I don't need any of the proceeds. Look, they're all going to go to fight human trafficking. Like that to me is the one mission that I want mm -hmm. to go after. And so 
I just said, hey, whatever this book produces, 100% of those dollars are going to go to to fight these efforts and, and fight for people, fight mm-hmm. for their right. The content can help people find financial freedom, but the proceeds are going to help really buy real human freedom and protect people and wow. rescue people. And so as of January last year, the Lifestyle Investor book is actually a top 1% of all books ever sold based on wow. volume. And we've been able to donate hundreds of thousands of dollars to these human trafficking prevention efforts. So it's been pretty cool. Amazing. So it really, when you say, what are some goals? Like for me, I just followed the thing that some of the questions I asked were like, what would I do if I didn't have to do anything? Cause I have passive income. So technically I don't have to do anything, but that's really boring. I have to do something. So what is in the most alignment? And, and so this is what kind of came up and I credit one of my friends for even writing the book because I had a number of people that asked me for years to write it. And I just, I didn't consider myself an author. I didn't feel like I had a lot to add. I didn't know if people would listen to me. And and my friends were like, just do it, just write it. And one of my buddies said, what if you die and your daughter never learns all these things you figured out about investing? And that was it. I just started writing the book the next day. That was enough leverage. And so it's cool to see what it's turned into. In fact, the updated and expanded edition comes out next month uh, at South by Southwest, which is really neat. But it's neat to see what it's turned into. And the podcast is the top 1% of all downloaded podcasts. And the mastermind has just had tremendous success as well. And it's all, I think, because I followed this idea of what would I want to spend my time doing? What would I do anyway that I wouldn't even need to make money? And then is there actually a market for that? It turns out there is, which is cool. My son, I've mentioned this a few times on past podcasts, but I think it's worth mentioning again because it's really important. My son asked me one time, dad, have you ever considered when you're going to retire? And I said to him, if you're my age and you're already looking at retirement, you failed. And Mm -hmm. he says, I don't understand. And I said, you need to find something that you love what you do so much that even if you had all the money in the world, you would still go ahead and do it. And that is the ultimate. I said, right now, I feel like in some ways I'm retired. Now I work a lot of hours and I'm not afraid to admit it, but work is play. I get so much energy from my work and so much enjoyment from my work. I work not because I have to, but because I want to. And, you know, that right there in and of itself, it allows you to see opportunities that other people can't see. You create this magnetism about you that is very authentic and genuine that other people are attracted to. Like you said, you like to read about this stuff and educate and learn, and you're going to continuously develop all these edges that other people won't. And you know what? Actually, it doesn't matter what business you start or what you do. Because you're going to find millionaires created in about every little niche, nook, and cranny than you could imagine. So it's just a matter of putting your stake in the ground and going all in on it. So I know, Justin, we're pushing up against the clock. I want to be respectful of your time. If there was one tip, what would you say your biggest, best tip is you can give for our listeners that want to go beyond some figures. The key is surrounding yourself by others that have done it. And I think I can't stress the importance of having a mentor. I can't stress the importance of finding a peer group of like-minded people that play the game of life and business and wealth creation at a higher level than you do. That to me is the name of the game and building authentic relationships with those people that can help you learn and grow so that you then can be a vessel to mentor others in the future. I love And now people want to learn more about you and the work that you do. Where do we send them? You can go to lifestyleinvestor.com. We've got everything there from courses to master classes. We've got a mobile home park master class and investing in in those properties. We've got passive income master classes. We've got some live events. We've got a tax master class, a tax strategy master class that just came out. But everything about the mastermind, just go to lifestyleinvestor.com forward slash consultation my team would be happy to share some options with you. So you can talk to a dedicated person who hears your exact situation. And at the end of every podcast episode on the lifestyle investor is what is one step you can take towards financial freedom and living a life that 
design your terms that you desire, not by default, but by design. So that is Lifestyle Investor, or if you want to take it one step deeper, go to lifestyleinvestor.com forward slash consultation, and then you can figure out what's going on in your own unique scenario. We've talked a lot really about creating a bigger vision and growing wealth and a proportion of the vision that you're creating and the different buckets of income. Thank you very much for being a, a guest on today's show. And for all those listening, remember to check us out at predictableprofits.com. This is Charles Scott with my new friend, Justin Donald, and I will see you in another episode.